Yep, loud and clear. How's everybody doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good to see you. Likewise, likewise. <laughs> you know that flu bug going around. You all right? Uh, yeah. yeah, it is. It is. That time of year, and then it just it holds on in the back of your throat. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, want to thank you for accepting the invitation. Um, I think I give you like a real brief background. So I'm just give you a background on why you know what's here, and then I'm gonna just turn it all over to you to introduce yourself and to um, okay. structure it how you you know how you want it to go. So, mm -hmm. you know, as an organization, we've now been traveling internationally. So we just got back from Africa. And Sweet. we went to Ghana. We were there as practically 30 girls total between the Ghanaian girls and the American girls. We took 13 um, girls mm -hmm. who were drone pilots. And so we mapped an area over there and we just did a lot of that research and history. And one of the concerns I had in, you know, just doing the work in general was making sure that the girls are processing in a, you know, in a way, having the language to be able to understand it. And when we came back, one of the questions that came up was, why didn't they just run, you know, how were they able to be enslaved? Like, you know, your, your thought is like, oh, I would have just fought or I would have just done this. And I was like, it's, it's bigger than that. And so that kind of gave me the clue for where we needed to go with, you know, talking about that piece of it. And then I thought of you. I was like, oh, I know exactly who I need. He's a, you know, story and genealogist, you know, middle health professional. Like it was just perfect. And so I really thank you for accepting the invitation. And with that, if you have any questions for me or any of the girls as we go along, um, but I'm just turn it over and let you do what you do. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. And I'm glad that, you know, um, you all are expanding and able to experience various different uh, places that you know, I still haven't been to the motherland yet, so I gotta, I gotta get over there. I was supposed to go a couple of years ago during the pandemic, but of course, you know that that whole thing got shut down, <laughs> and yes. so that that paused that. I was supposed to go to the New Gambia and then also uh, to Ghana and a couple other places, and so hopefully um, this year um, I got some things on the books planned for that. Um, but yeah, so I, I thank everybody for um, showing up. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, like she mentioned, my name is Frederick Murphy. I am a mental health therapist as well as a documentarian, and I live in the state of North Carolina. I am um, a Southerner, um, lived in Louisiana, Georgia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. So the subject matter in which what we're talking about, I've been in all the states where this is very, very prevalent. And, you know, I think that that question that you mentioned, it comes up a lot. Well, why didn't you just run? But the fact of the matter is, people aren't necessarily exposed to how many enslavement revolts actually happen. People did run. <laughs> people did murder the individuals who were holding them in bondage, right? And so I think that from a macro level, people are looking at things from um, maybe not from a bird's eye view, and looking at it, oh, I'm sorry, maybe looking at it from a, a macro view to where everyone should have done this at the same time, right? But the fact of the matter is these were happening since the early 1700s um, all throughout the country. And not only here, but in the Caribbean, uh, on, on the continent, uh, and just everywhere there was enslavement, there were some sense of some, there, was, there were revolts, right? You have to, to just kind of really hone in and do some research on it. Um, the Stono Rebellion is one that was here in Charleston. Uh, obviously, Nate, Nate Turner, I'm sorry, Nat Turner, uh, there in Southampton. Those are some of the, the the famous ones that that people know about. And so they were happening all across the country, right? And so when we talk about the psychology of this, right? And and I sit on the board of the Slave Dwelling Project, and what we do is we go into existing slave dwellings that are still standing, and we stay the night. And we bring attention to these structures that a lot of people skip whenever they go to former plantation sites just to go to the big house. But you don't have the big house if it isn't for the small houses that were there up front, right? And so in the state of South Carolina and in the state of Mississippi um, in the early 1700s, um, more Blacks... Um, and, and other people of color 
were the highest population. And you will also find that on most plantations. But when we think about things from a psychological standpoint, and I'm just gonna say things like kind of like in layman's terms, like if a person's looking for a house and you say, oh, well, what part of town? And maybe this is my generation, but you would say, oh, it may be on the white part of town or it may be on the black part of town, right? And there's like these invisible lines that you can cross in this day and age, but you know that there could be something that comes with it from a discrimination standpoint. So we have to ask ourselves what historically has embedded that ideology in our minds, even though we're free to go anywhere we want, but to know that you can be treated differently somewhere else versus where you're at and where you may feel comfortable at. When we talk about individuals who have been put in bondage for such a long period of time, um, the same premise is there, especially when you have family involved and the danger of you revolting or the danger of you speaking out can cause a ripple effect on every person that's in your lineage. They can either be sold, killed is not likely during the institution of slavery because no one's going to harm their property to the point where you lose value. That That's the complete opposite of what an owner is to do, right? When we start seeing these different hangings and stuff like that of, 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 of people of color, you're seeing that more so post-emancipation and you're seeing that more post-emancipation because the value that that person once held is not there anymore because this person is said to have the privileges to go and do whatever it is that they want to do freely, you know, even though black codes are still in place and all those different things. So we know that the average enslaved person uh, may not have seen a mile outside of a plantation that they were held, right? Unless you were a person who um, was an overseer, uh, and, and when I'm the overseer, I mean, so there's like two levels, right? There's like the enforcer and then there's the overseer. And, and most of the times the overseer is the person who enforced the, the enforcer, which was most likely an enslaved individuals to do these devilish acts, right? Against their will in most cases, against family members, right? And so when you have been conditioned mentally to fall in line with that system that has been put in place, Sometimes it's just like an automated system that goes off in our heads and in our, our person to just do the tasks at hand. For instance, every morning I get up and I go and I brush my teeth. That's like the very first thing that I do. It's just automated that that's what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to eat by a certain period of time. I may say a prayer at a certain period of time. I may do all these things that are just very conditioned. And so when we talk about Pavlov's law and classical conditioning, that's exactly what happens when we talk about human beings and the um, um, the instance of enslavement. You're constantly grooming and training that person on a daily basis. And you're doing things that are very um, inhumane to get that person to act the way in which you want him or her to act. So that may be rationing out food. That may be saying, okay, I'm gonna give you this plot of gardening. Of, 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 of land so you can plant your own garden. So that's the reverse psychology. That's the, oh, well, this person is benevolent. They're giving me land so I can create sustenance for myself and my family, right? And then not only that, when we talk about things from a religious standpoint, um, we can talk about how the Bible, of course, was weaponized against enslaved individuals. And so you have this whole... Um, 360 of various different, and that's not even all of them, various different things that people, that enslavers did to make sure psychologically you didn't necessarily have a leg to stand on because of the risk that was happening while you were uh, enslaved under those persons, right? Um, so I, I just, I, I don't want to keep running my mouth. I, I, I want to ask if anyone has any questions thus far. Uh, I really looked at this as just being able, uh, I looked at this as us being all able to just kind of have a conversation and just talk, kind of uh, question and answer. And, you know, I look at all these opportunities as as uh, collaborative learning opportunities because I don't know it all, 
some of y'all may know more than me and you know we're sharing information so that's what makes this helpful so i want to open up the, the the floor for any questions thus far all right we have a question um i'm not entirely sure if you were planning on mentioning this later but um what would you say were the unique experiences of black enslaved women and if they had mm -hmm. any unique forms of resistance as opposed to like black enslaved men mm. yeah most definitely um so there was a plantation that was in alabama where this woman who was enslaved um she um was pregnant and the enslaver and a neighbor made a bet she delivered the baby via c-section so they, they cut her open and they put a kitten inside of her womb after the baby was taken out and they sold it up they sold up her womb and they made a bet on how long it would take for the kitten to get out of the woman's body right like when we talk about the experiences of women in the institution of slavery and i'm not comparing at all between men and women but it was so vile and inhumane, right? So just, just think about it. A person is taking a bet on your body. The second you give birth to a child, a, a cat is put inside your womb and they're seeing how long it's going to take. They're betting on how long it's going to take for that cat to get out of your body because they know that the cat's going to use its claws <laughs> and it's going to scratch, right, its way out. And that's exactly what happened. And unfortunately, that woman died. And these are things that have been documented. I tell you, like there's so many acts of violence towards women um, who are enslaved um, that pertain to, of course, their body, that it's, it's just ridiculous, right? And so th that's a notion. The, the constant fear of being sexually assaulted was always there. And there was no one to come and save you in right. most instances, unless a person took the liberty upon themselves to fight back, in yep. which some people actually did do that, which is, of course, a very noble uh, thing to do, right? But it came with consequences. Do I fight back and become one of the problem Negroes, and then I get shipped further south or to this person or to that person? Or do I suffer these lashes, right? Do I do, these are all the things that individuals have to process on a daily basis as they're under the helm of enslavement. And even free people of color during the time period from uh, a mental health aspect of things were very anxious because of the simple fact that, yeah, you may be free, but at any point of time, you can be captured and put into the system of enslavement, right? And so for women, there was always this heightened sense of um, like this three-headed monster being separated from your family, being raped, um, as well as um, being physically abused. And then not only that, the, the fourth one, and, and I don't know if you all have read this book, but it's called They Were Her Property. The women of the wives of these enslaved, of these uh, men enslavers, were barbaric towards the women uh, who, who were enslaved. And most of it was because of jealousy. Uh, because if their husband has chosen to take his own liberties by force with uh, an enslaved woman, are you telling me that a, a wife is not going to get jealous of that? It's not like she has her pick of the litter and we're in a metropolitan space where she can go around and get her lick back at any point in time that she wants, right? You're out on these plantations that are hundreds of acres. So you have to sit with that. And then not only that, if there, if the, the husband is, is utilizing the words of the Bible to manipulate not only the enslaved individuals, but also his wife, then you, you're fighting a double-headed monster. But in that, with that being said, there have been cases where women who were enslaved and had access to food and all these different things, they would poison people. They would pay, they would, they would come up with various different craft ways to utilize the utensils and the instruments that they had in front of them to make life live in hell as much as possible for people that were harming their persons or 
their uh, their uh, offspring, right, or even parents. And so um, women have always fought back against the institution of slavery in various different ways. Um, and most of the times they were crafty uh, enough to utilize um, their skill set and what they were supposed to be doing to do such. When you were saying that, that reminds me of the story from Cape Coast Castle of the wife who came over to, I don't remember their exact names, but she came over because her husband had been in Ghana and she was getting jealous and trying to figure out what are you doing over there? And he had a, you know, a black woman that, you know, an enslaved mm -hmm. woman that he was uh, giving some privileges to. So she was, you know, and the woman died very soon after. And it was always questioned whether or not mm -hmm. she was poisoned or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, we, 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 we are very ingenious with ways um, to get autonomy to the best of our ability, to gain some sense of autonomy. Very difficult in a situation where the laws are against you, personal preferences, state, and the religious state is against you. Um, however, um, women took their chances to do the best that they can to keep some type of autonomy within their lives, for sure. Yeah, good question. Any others so far? No, not yet? Okay, cool, good stuff. And so, um, you know, from, a, from the continuation of, of enslavement, um, when we look at individuals like Oni Judge, and Oni was an individual who was enslaved by um, George Washington, and this was in Pennsylvania, right? And a lot of people may not know this, but George George Washington, he was um, infatuated with this woman um, who had escaped. He spent over 10 years trying to find this woman, right? And um, that isn't the only high profile case in which you have these enslavers who are infatuated with black women, with women of color, of indigenous descent as well. There are multiple of these specific instances. And it's 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 not something that's really even siloed in the institution of slavery because post-emancipation as well, and I'm talking about up to the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, and I've sat down and interviewed some of these individuals' children, men were still raping, quote unquote, the help, right? Um, and so what you would see, which was really prevalent during the 1940s, 30s, 50s, and 60s, is that um, uh, women of African descent would be the, the, the maids, if you will, for white um, homeowners. And they, may, they wouldn't necessarily live with them. They may live close by, or they would just have to find their way to this person's house. But they would go in and do domestic work, right? Because there was a time period in which women couldn't be CEOs, uh, and in abundance and all these other things. And what was happening is, and, and this is directly from the horse's mouth, I'm gonna quote this from a woman, whenever my mom would go to, not mine, but a person that I interviewed, um, whenever my mother would go to this person's house, he would give his wife money to leave and go shopping. And then that's when the rapes would occur, right? And so this is an instance in Alabama uh, in, in, in which this woman was, was was the product of a rape. And what happened was when the mother had the child, because the mother was married, she she had a Black husband, and the child come, came out um, as what they would identify as mulatto then. The white man paid for the woman to leave Alabama and go to Michigan and was to never come back to the South again. Right? She left her husband and left her son that was by her oldest son that was by her actual husband because he threatened, he was, he was in a position of power and he threatened to do harm to not only her, but also to the rest of her family. So she got out of Dodge and she eventually gave up that child for adoption when she got to Michigan and lived alone, a lonely life, right? And so I say all this to say that the attributes and the in-depth um, happenings, if you will, during the institution of slavery just really manifested and manipulated itself 
even up until present day, in my personal opinion, because women of color's body is a huge seller. It's the quote unquote exotic feel that, and this is my subjective opinion, that white men feel comes with um, people of color that are women. It's like a, it's literally like a dark, twisted fantasy for some of these individuals. And when you have been able to control the bodies of those individuals inherent in, 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 uh, innately from generation to generation to generation, um, why would a person now in 2024 not feel as if they can do the same thing? So when you look at record executive, executives or or Hollywood and how they want women to look, um, you ha we have to ask ourselves where does that come from, right? Where where does the where did the inception of that begin? And I think that a lot of these things we can point back to different types, different time periods in our lives that um, was driven by the oppression of um, a gender from a gender that is not not female. And so it's a lot of different in and outs as it relates to when we talk about con the controlling of a person's mind, body, and soul. So essentially they're a holistic person because you can lose your spiritual um, balance <laughs> through these types of acts. Because think about how many nights these enslaved women and men prayed for change. And they may not have ever gotten it. It may have been the same way all the way up until, their, until they died or until they see their grandchildren and their grandchildren is born into the institution of enslavement as well. Are you telling me that you don't think that that would break a person down spiritually? Being that they've never been able to function freely and, and have autonomy and choice solely over the things or the people that mean the most to them? Because that's how deep it is mentally and emotionally on a daily basis. Bridget, when you're talking about the grooming and the, you know, the, the long time conditioning, um, one of the things that we were surprised and going is that, well, I guess we shouldn't be surprised, but were is that history is really only taught from a post-colonial standpoint all over the world, even in Africa. Um, mm -hmm. None of our Ghanaian students really had any um, information or background into pre-colonial Africa. So that whole trip was a lot of new information for them. And one of the things yes. that stirred up was some anger at their own, um, you know, Africans who participated. And I'm yes. just curious what you know about, like, you know, we talk about Africans who, you know, participated in the slave trade. And then there's, you know, the, or the culturally, it was a different concept of, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't have a, full concept but as time went on and like that shift from you know Africa to the states to where the participation um even though yes it, it was forced but just like that mindset can you speak to mm -hmm. any of that history because that was one of the things that many of them were grappling with was you know how could you do this yeah. to your own yeah and, you know, I think that the most recent case for this to um, to be brought to light was through the Clotilda. Uh, is anyone familiar with the Clotilda, the last ship of enslavement um, that reached the shores of Mobile, Alabama? Um, and so, but let's just, let's, so the transatlantic slave trade ended in 1808, I believe, 1808, 1806. Uh, but let's, let's let's be very clear. There were still people that were being brought over illegally. Um, it, it it just happened, right? There's evidence of that. So I did a short film titled Sweet Home Alabama, Chief and His Protege, where I interviewed uh, a sister by the name of Joycelyn Davis. And she is the third great granddaughter of Chief Aluile, who was on the Clotilda, which was the last slave ship here, brought here to the United States. And they just had a, a Netflix film that was released also last year called Descendant. And it discusses the, the Clotilda, right? In that specific case, there was an agreement with um, the Kingdom of Dahomey in Africa and the Mayer family and one other family in Alabama. And it was a bet that the Mayer family couldn't go to Africa and ascertain these enslaved individuals. 
Well, it happened. And I want to say it was roughly about 110 individuals were commandeered by the people in the kingdom of Dahomey and sent to Mobile, Alabama in 1860, right? So again, the transatlantic slave trade had been ended. The only thing that was supposed to have been going on was the domestic slave trade, right? And so what's so hurtful about that is to your point, right, Ms. Baxter, is that there had to be some conscious understanding of what was going on with your cousins across the water that you captured, whether they were in the Caribbean now or whether they were in the United States, right? There's just no way around not knowing what was going on. I think, yeah, in early on, you can use that because when the white folks first got to the, the continent and you're trading liquor and jewelry and this and that, this and that, this and that for people, which is, you know, it just sounds crazy, but it happened. Um, you may not have known what the circumstances were going to be. You may have thought that they were going to be indentured servants like they were when they were on the on the continent. But there was enough news going around that discussed what was happening in the United States, right? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so even myself, I have conflict sometimes with the disconnect between the two, right? Meaning brothers and sisters that are here in the Americas versus brothers and sisters that's over in on the continent. Because to your point, a lot of them don't even know. And that was part of the reason why I was going to go over there to give the presentation to, to show one of my films was to discuss that. In April, I had the opportunity, myself and Sister Joycelyn, who's in the, in, in the film, to speak to uh, 80 students from 30, uh, from 30 different countries in Africa. And so we had dialogue around this. And a lot of this stuff, to your point, they just did not know. Even some of the teachers did not know. And so... Um, when these various different missionaries came to the to to Africa and and, and taught the, the English language and introduced them to Christianity in a different way in which they've always known, um, it just did a great job of whitewashing a lot of things to where you're on the soil there, on the continent of Africa, and aren't necessarily aware of what was happening to your family that was, you know many, many miles, thousands of miles away in the United States on the sugarcane plantations in the Caribbean, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, yeah, it's conflicting because it's like, well, why isn't there a better sense of unification, especially when you talk about um, Black Americans, I'll just use that term, people that were born here in the United States had fought so hard for all types of immigration to be able to occur in this country, including our African brothers and sisters, right? Um, but we get labeled as being lazy, as complaining, and all these other um, uh, taglines that come with Black folks here in the United States post-emancipation when we can't do for you what we did, unless it's in entertainment or sports at this point, right? Um, so that's, that's my take on it, but I also have another take on it, and I, and I'm, I do believe that brothers and sisters were here, uh, you know, prior to 1619. It's been documented. The Spanish conquistadors said it, that they that there were people here that looked like people in Africa, right? So there are, and this is all my personal opinion, that there are people, there was a book called They Were Here Before Columbus, which is another good book to read, that talks about people of African descent's presence here in the United States prior to all of these other folks. And, I, and I'm actually, it's interesting because I'm actually just re I'm reading this book right here, 19 white men who admitted they were indigenous black peoples in the Americas, right? And so, um, so when I answer that question for you, it's, it's kind of twofold because some of it uh, relates directly to the people who were in, uh, selling in, uh, you know, or trading brothers and sisters. But I do believe that there was a, a solid population of folks already here as well that traveled because these Spanish conquistadors used um, um, 
travel guides from the continent of Africa to get to all of these different countries and these different continents. So we're just that smart. Anyone else have any questions, thoughts? Jump in. Has anyone heard of the term drapetomania? No? Okay, so there was a physician by the last name, um, oh man, Cartwright. Let me, I think it is, I think this one's Cartwright. Let me, give me one second here. Uh, I think this is, I think it's Cartwright. I want to make sure I give you all. Yep, Samuel A. Cartwright, okay? <clears throat> Samuel A. Cartwright was a, was a medical professional who coined the term drapetomania. And drapetomania was one of the early diagnoses of enslaved people who left the plantations. They thought that they were crazy. Because they're in their heads, now he was an enslaver. If you're being provided food, shelter, shoes, water, all these different things, you must be crazy to leave such a beautiful setup, regardless of the conditions that you're in, right? So he did that because he was, you know, of course, leaning into other enslaved uh, Enslaved, uh, I'm sorry, slave owners, enslavement owners, to um, identify and validate his quote unquote research on why people would want to leave. Because if they feel like they've given you everything that you need, then why would you want more? Right? So when we think about that in today's day and age, or even right after emancipation, specifically the HBCUs, and I, and I attended two HBCUs and I was the director of counselor at one. When you say, well, we've given you your schools, why would you want more? And then we have to ask ourselves, were you, were you, because not all HBCUs were completely funded by black folks, but did you give that money as a starter to make sure that our races didn't mix? Or was it because it was a very be benevolent thing for you to do? I tend to go more with the very first piece of, 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 of my conscience because it still took a hundred years before in 1965 before into before desegregation actually took place right so think about the, the fundamental aspects of hbcus and yes we need we needed them because we needed to be taught by our own et cetera et cetera but for those individuals who were even former enslavers or even individuals that were fighting for the, the freedom of black folks. I think we have to ask ourselves, what was the angle? Was it to make sure that we still had our own space and would not necessarily be intertwined with your world? Um, or was it just 1000% out of the goodness of your heart that you want that? Because, you know, partly if that was the case, then earlier on, we should have had more schools um, that were integrated. I mean, we have Berea College, which was in Kentucky, um, and there were a couple of other ones, but not a lot, not a lot at all. And so even after the soldiers came back with the GI Bill, Black folks couldn't use the GI Bill to go to predominantly white institutions. So it's always been these things in place that make you go, hmm, right? They, they, they make you kind of question what was the angle that folks were coming at. And, I, and, and, and it's, it's sad that you have to constantly think doubly about those types of things. But when you look at the history from a historical aspect um, of our uh, ancestors being in this country, uh, whether it was from an indigenous standpoint or being brought over here, everything was in question as it relates to how genuine these persons are with what it is that they're providing us as it, as it relates to a resource. So drapetomania kind of goes into that same thing. Well, we've given you something. Why would you, why wouldn't you want to just stay where you're at? It only makes sense. 
And he published that term in the New Orleans Medical Journal, I believe. And he was specifically charged with um, researching um, the behaviors of enslaved people. Samuel Cartwright, Drapetomania. That's good because I didn't, I'd never heard that before. Um, in my own research, something that I've been curious about when, do, you know, using the, the DNA and then finding records to where post 1865 family members were still living with their enslaver in the same yeah. house. My mm -hmm. third great grandmother with her children, with the enslaver and the enslaver's wife in the house. And like you're saying, like, I can only imagine the hell that that was, but is that part of that conditioning, you know, and that lack of access to resources? Because, you know, people want to romanticize it, like maybe there was true love, but, you know, when you have that kind of power dynamic, is that even possible? And, you know, what's your thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, Shelly, I would look at it from this aspect. You know how you got a lot of people to say, oh, well, if I was a slave, I couldn't have been one because I would have done this or I would have done that, boom, 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 boom. Listen, no one knows what you're going to do unless you're in that situation. No one knew what they would do in the 1960s when marches were going on. Some people had to make a choice that do I go out there and I march physically? Is that how I uh, contribute uh, uh, when I have these two little ones at home and the clans coming around putting crosses in people's houses or people are shooting black folks dead in the street? Or do I fight differently? Right. If you're coming from a space of inferiority, you don't know how to read and write, you, you don't know how to count, the only thing you've been conditioned to do for the past 60 years, 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, is what it is that you've always done. And now you have an opportunity to get paid for it, right? Doesn't that sound like a pretty good deal? I mean, you don't know the lay of the land, right? If you have never been off of, of off that plantation your whole life, you don't even know east, west, north, south. You don't know any of this stuff, right? You didn't have GPS back then. It's all wooded, wild animals, right? So, yeah, a lot of people just stayed. You know, the, these these uh, enslavers made it made it made it sound good. Like now you'll get paid. We'll do this contract. And my great grandfather, um, my great great grandfather got caught up in that mess and he just wrote an X on his name, wrote did this contract for sharecropping, 400 acres gone. 400. He, he was able to amass money from, from doing some sharecropping and then he had to leave that sharecropper uh, because that sharecropper passed and, and, but, and then he went to another one, but they were saving the little change that they were making from it and then the new sharecropper. Um, even though my uh, my my uh, grandparents had their own land back then, my ancestors, um, the new person that they were sharecropping for was kind of levying the property with them being able to meet crops on the, in, in this new agreement, and they weren't able to meet the crops, so the land was taken in in, in a neighboring county, which was just a couple of feet away, right? And so that's how aggressive this thing was when we talk about tenant farming and sharecropping, right? And they were still contracts to keep people as, um, what's the word? Pr apprentices is what they would call them, apprentices. Uh, up until some of these people were 18, there was this guy in um, Middle Tennessee and uh, his last name was Hunt, W.R. Hunt. He was the enslaver who, he was a slave trader. He sold my family, but he also were getting these apprentices. And there was this one contract that I seen of this young lady who was eight, I believe. And in the apprentice contract, she wasn't to leave until she was 18 years old. And her mother could only visit her on Sunday for two hours. For two hours. This is post-emancipation, Right. And so just think about what you what we all do on a daily basis. We become accustomed to just doing what it is that we know. And, and then when we're we're actually able to be told that we're good at it and we were able to get a couple of dollars here and there, 
to probably utilize at the store of the enslaver because some of it was was banknotes or was was just IOUs, if you will. Um, but they couldn't be used in, but anywhere on but on the property in which you are sharecropping and where you were formerly enslaved. Just think about it. You know the kids, you raised part of the, the kids. If any of them treated you somewhat decent and humane, you may stay there. But then there were a lot of folks that said, you know what? No, we're going to forge a new path. We're going to make a way. And then there were also free black settlements and, 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 and interracial uh, indigenous and black settlements that were around that were also encouraging people to come. We can build our own. We can start our own. And so you had some individuals doing that. So I don't think that because some people may call people that stayed weak. But I think that people did the best that they could with what they had. And some people may have started off on these plantations, but then they some of them left because I had an ancestor who was living with their former enslaved, and he eventually left. Right, and so I, I think just with anything, um, when we're in this process of evolution and growth, um, that we got to figure it out along the way. And some people have stayed and died on those plantations after post emancipation, uh, and then some people, um, you know really were able to liberate themselves and not be engaged in that type of uh, foolishness or, you know, or what have you. So, yeah. And, and I've got a question for you, Shelly. So um, uh, I am n next month, no, actually maybe the end of this month, I am, I have a traveling exhibit of enslaved um, workers at the iron furnaces and women were enslaved at the iron furnaces as well. One of the biggest um, enslavers at the Iron Furnaces in Middle Tennessee is a Baxter. Huge enslaver was a Baxter. So do you have any ties to Middle Tennessee? So uh, my dad is a Baxter and yes and no. Um, by okay. doing research and some of the connections, um, I just recently started seeing Tennessee, literally it's funny you say that, in the past month, um, starting to see a mm. lot you know, of trends as I'm for some reason, there's you know there's a piece of sticky DNA that has stuck over generations. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of 100% Euro showing up as third cousins. Yeah, yeah. Know, to this day, and so in tracing theirs, there is some in Tennessee. Yeah, but yeah, well, definitely I'll let me know because I'm literally um yeah, let me know because I I have the Negro um Negro uh Louisa Furness book where Baxter who was a huge enslaver I think he came came out of Virginia, North Carolina, to Tennessee, in the quote-unquote New West. And there are tons of Baxters that are listed here in this document that I that I do have. And so um, with the iron furnaces, if you all don't know, that was a skill set that was brought over from West Africa. And with the iron furnaces, and women work there as well, we do have documentation of that. And they're acknowledged within the, the traveling exhibit that we have. Um, they were mostly leased out. Because to run an iron furnace, you would have to have at least 200 and up individuals that are manning the iron furnace because you have to use fire and you can't cut it off. You got to keep on going. Coal, wood, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so um, women worked at those iron furnaces as well, cleaning, washing, um, providing food and, and all of those things in which you would think uh, would be very domestic on an agricultural plantation. They were doing the same thing in the industrial plantations as well. So, um, you know, just let me know some yeah. names and then I can look through this huge 300 page document and see which Baxters are there. And, and you never know, it may be a connection with some of these folks. Yeah, we have a lot That's of how you Baxters. get those breakthroughs, those brick wall breaks. Yeah, Brand that's how you get it. <laughs> Yeah, we, we actually have some, uh, we actually have Baxters in my uh, family. My third great grandfather purchased, who was formerly enslaved, he purchased 98 acres of, of land after emancipation in 1880. And so uh, part of that was also for formerly enslaved individuals um, to bury their loved ones. So we have our cemetery, our Italian cemetery. We also, have, we also have Baxters in that in that cemetery. So you never know. Where is that? Is that in Tennessee as well? Yep, yep. It's in Tennessee, Dixon County. Yep, yep. I'll be looking, listen, you know, mess around, we be cousins. I know, right? That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but I feel like I've done a lot of talking. I'm just curious. Uh, does anyone did anyone have any any questions as it relates to things before I jump into something kind of like new age and and discuss and link the institution of slavery to that? But anything, any question at all? No question. It's a dumb question. You deal with teenagers. You have to just start calling on people. <laughs> so did everyone here today did everyone here go to the continent um i'm checking that all, yes. but, all but two okay but two. so so i would kind of like I, I would like to just ask a question just open for anyone that can answer um what is it what is there anything in particular that you learn new by being over there and how can you tie those experience to what it is that you've learned here in the United States, if, if at all. Um, I wanna see something. I think we have one of our Ghanaian girls here. Is this Princess Anne up here? I just unmuted you. Oh. Yeah, it's me. Anne? Hi, sweetie, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Please talk about you. <laughs> you can hear, so can you hear his question? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I do. Um, yes. <laughs> don't be shy it now. We like can hear his question. So you got to speak up, baby. Do not do that shy thing with me today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And please, can you repeat your question? Yeah. So my my question is the differences of what you've learned as it relates to the institution of slavery in the United States versus on the continent of Africa. Was there anything that was alarming that, that stuck out, stuck, stuck out to you? Um, anything that was absolutely new? I'm just kind of curious what what the experiences were, were was like for you all, not only mentally, but also spiritually as well, if you're a spiritual person. Um It was alarming how they found like pleasure in making us suffer. How mm -hmm. um, whenever they wanted to constantly degrade us for just to make them feel happy, that was alarming for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Okay. It's, it's, it's tough to hear those things. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, um, when, when we talk about like the brutality and the degrading. Um, I went to, uh, they're called the great houses in in Jamaica. And those are, it's the same thing as the plantations. It's, it's just called the great house and then over there and then it's, there are plantations in the United States and other places. And on one of our tours, um, an individual had a bear trap. Um, on the tour as one of the artifacts that was in this former great house, which is a plantation. And one of the things that she says was, she says, have you all ever seen bears in Jamaica? I'm like, no, I've never even, no, there's no bears in Jamaica, like, right? And she said, exactly. She said, what would happen is the women and the men who were enslavers would set up bear traps around the premises of the plantations for those who tried to run. And she told us this one specific instance where a woman tried to run and the bear trap caught her leg. And of course she was screaming and wincing and the enslaved enslaver, which was a woman, went out there and just sat down by her, eating, degrading her for hours while she was still on this bear trap. And then she eventually got the overseer and they came and got her. But she sat there and watched her suffer in her own delight, right? And the woman's foot had to be amputated. Because you remember, you don't you can't kill them. They need to be of use. This is your property, right? This is your property. You don't eliminate them, right? This is this um uh, having this property lends itself to what your wealth looks like. Uh, it lends itself to what, how the operations around the, the, the plantation, how smoothly it's ran on a daily basis. Uh, it's also uh, lends itself to 
excuse me, the reproduction of more babies that can get put into the exact same system. So another thing is this, just hearing, just me saying that made me think of this. For a lot of people who say that there weren't a lot of that, because so, you have some people that say that slavery didn't, didn't exist. Like there are people out there that 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 believe that. Um, when you talk, and they say that to say that, uh, well, in the United States, it wasn't nowhere near as many individuals that were brought here through enslavement as it was in Brazil and the Caribbean and all those things. And yes, we do know that. I mean, it, it's factual. We we know that. That's not nothing that's new. But in 1808, after the transatlantic slave trade was over. How do you think the population of enslaved individuals increased? The, po the, the our population numbers didn't stop, right? They were forced to procreate. So if you just say that, okay, well, I'm just throwing a number out. Eight hundred thousand people were brought over here to the United States. Millions in the Caribbean. The number doesn't stop at eight hundred thousand. It keeps going and it keeps going because now you did have breeding farms that were happening. In Farsalia, Virginia, there's a plantation called Farsalia in particular. That was one of the plantations to where over 300 children were born. I, I shot a documentary with the descendants and we went up to the hospital where they would pretty much mate men and women on that plantation site and their records and the Massey Records, that's his name. His name was Thomas and William Massey, son and son and uh, and, and and father. And they, on that Farsalia plantation, over three hundred children were born. So you had to procreate after the transatlantic slave trade ended. So for all these naysayers, right, that said that the institution of slavery did not exist, because you do have them, and you got people that look like me that say this. Right? Then you have to ask the question, you, or, or you can say, you know what, you are right. There weren't as many enslaved individuals that were brought to the United States as it was throughout the Caribbean and Brazil. However, after the transatlantic slave trade ended, these enslavers knew to uptick and to keep production going the way that they needed to, that they needed to start forcing these people to have children so you could keep up with production. And so, again, another violation of both men and women who may not have even been in love with these people, but you are forced to have children with them so they can be put into the systemic um, carnage of uh, the institution of slavery. Now we go back to your original question where you guys can speak out on your experience um in africa i'm looking at my screen so i'm going to start with luxury because i see your face um just what we experienced in ghana it honestly felt really surreal when we went to the slave castles like actually being in the spot where they were like completely treated like they weren't even human like shoving them into these rooms like there weren't even a lot of us compared to how many there were originally in those rooms but when we were in there it was really hot it was extremely uncomfortable to be in there and imagining like how it was for probably triple the amount of people that were in there it it felt like so it felt really unreal to be in that same place just a couple years after. Yeah, thank you for that. You're on mute, she. Shelly. Yeah, you're on mute, Shelly. Kennedy? Is 
sorry. Um, I was, I would have to say my experience at Ghana was definitely just also surreal and almost also amazing because I would have never thought in my lifetime that I would be able to travel to Africa in general, but here I was, I hopped on a flight and I was there the next time I opened my eyes, but it was just an absolutely amazing experience and being able to not only be in the motherland, but to be where my ancestors were once upon a time. And especially to know that I'm also like, I have Ghanaian ancestry there. So to know mm. that this is, this is home, like truly it did feel like home for me. And it just emphasized how important our work was. So Beautiful. Um, Nalaja, are you there? Oh, she's gonna be on her phone. Okay, let's see if we have still see. Ecclesia. Um, I think one of the parts from our trip that really stuck with me was when we went to the slave castles, but I was noticing a pattern where um uh, a lot of the like Elmina Castle and the Cape Coast Castle, like they all had churches in them. Mm -hmm. And especially I think it was at Cape Coast Castle where it was there was a church directly above the entrance of the male dungeons, which was like very ironic for me because like in one place there's people worshiping um, their religion and then like dehumanizing people like in the same spot which was tough for me I guess to imagine so let me let me ask you this question Th and thank you for sharing what today do you think makes any of that different we are in a space right now to where we're coming up on an election where everyone are staunch Christians that are running but they're saying that these people shouldn't be here, making fun of this person. They're making fun of that person. They're doing all these different things, right? And if they're a foundation Christian, these things shouldn't be done. However, they're utilizing what historically has been done, i.e. based on you know just what you just mentioned, like it's ironic that below this church, where people are praising upstairs that this is going on downstairs, right? It, it goes to show the, uh, the the hypocrisy sometimes that comes into play when individuals um, utilize religion innately. They may not say it, but innately to justify their actions, which is absolutely asinine on so many different levels but we're seeing it happening real time and it's always happened. There was never a separation of church and state in my personal opinion, even though that's what was supposed to, to happen. And that's not to, to, I'm not bashing Christianity because multiple religions are manipulated depending on who's utilizing it. Right. But that's the tough thing that you have to grapple with is like, how are you participating in this ungodly thing? in a very abrasive way and expect for me to respect you, expect for me to 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 buy into your campaign, expect for me to even potentially even adopt the religion in itself when you have been the um, face of what it represents for such a long period of time. And white folks have been the face of Christianity in this country for a very, very long time. So that still goes on is what I'm is ultimately what I'm saying. It was one of their first weapons. Um Halima. Hi everyone. So for me, I had a really great time in Ghana. Uh, something that stuck out to me was when we were in Cape Coast Castle and he started talking about, our tour guide was talking about formal education and how the school there was only for the children that were like mixed. 
And I think that's just like another kind of like another way that um like Africans were I guess like separated and kind of made to feel like, oh, she's better than me because she has lighter skin or he's better than me because his father um assaulted his mother and thus he's like he was born and things like that. And I had never really thought about like how other people and other cultures were teaching before like colonization because I guess I I was never around for that and I never really I never thought about it much yeah thank you for that yeah the colorism is definitely um worldwide and that's in any culture that's an Asian culture it's an India culture that's an American Indian culture that's it's it's everywhere it's in Black culture, African American culture, it's in the Caribbean culture, um, and so uh, that the whole phrase that white is right, um, there's something to be said about that because uh, there are certain privileges that people who are of more fair skin are able to get, and again, that's even within uh, a culture within a culture, in which that happens. I think some of our girls they had to go with other commitments. Um, I have a question regarding the enslavement in Europe, like in Britain. What did was it primarily? Like I know that from our research, we we're getting ready to go to London. Um, following the money, or at least that's our goal. We're praying about. We got to get the money. Um, but that's what we're looking to do and in terms of like following money and understanding like what did enslavement look like you know learning that the connections between you know the the caribbean and britain which you know in modern day you don't see them having any relationship and then when you do that deep research and understand like that's where a lot of them came from to there and were some of the largest participators but what did actual enslavement look like in you know, the UK among the people, not so much the business part of it, but like similar to how we talk about, you know, in what enslavement looked like in the United States. Do you know anything about what it looked like in on a day-to-day, -day, like, you know, in the UK? Well, you know, I, I'm not necessarily um, versed on that. However, I have been to Bermuda and I have been to Jamaica. And guess who controlled both of those places at one point? Yeah. Okay. And so I wouldn't think just because it's in the UK that the behaviors would be different there versus than what it was in a Britain, in, in a controlled environment uh, by the UK, by folks in, you know, from the United Kingdom. So I would dare say that it probably looked the same because when you look at those sugar plantations on those, on the, um, uh, within the Caribbean, I mean, it was hard driven enslavement, right? I mean, the British folks were ruthless as it relates to their enslavement. And the documents show that. Um, the oral histories show that. The books show that. So um, as it relates to what the landscape looks looked like uh, intrinsically there in uh, the UK, I'm not necessarily sure. However, I've been to places that have been controlled by the UK, you know, via the institution of slavery. And I wouldn't think that it would be far off from that. Because the thing is, how can it? You, you can't be a nice enslaver, right? Like, it, to, I mean, how can you? If, if you have to have this, men, excuse me, mental conditioning over a person to where they, are the majority at a site and choose to stay there, you, you gotta have some hard driven practices to where they feel that the consequences are that great on a negative aspect that they won't even take the chance because of what can potentially come from that, which is the heartbreak, which could potentially be death, you know, and separated or a limb to be taken. All these things that individuals can do Right. There have been multiple different uh, revolts to where um, 
there's this street that's not too far off of, from Wilmington, and the chain the name isn't that anymore, but it used to be called Niggerhead Road. And what they did was when individuals revolted and they escaped, they hung, they put the heads of the individuals who tried to escape, they cut their heads off and they put them on these poles. So when people would come around this bend, they would see all these heads of formerly enslaved, of enslaved individuals with their heads cut off. The same thing happened at the Iron Furnaces in the, the, the presentation, I'm sorry, the uh, the traveling history exhibit that I'm I'm doing. We found the exact same thing. The heads were put on the poles, five people, right? And so I would think that it was very hard just as it was everywhere else because you literally have to separate your person and morph into this evil being that is completely heartless, a sociopath that drives this system that brings money to you on a consistent basis. And you know as well as I know that to do that, you can't have a heart. It would take the good God himself to come down and make changes. And in some cases that happened because some people were manumitted, right? Some people were touched, but a majority of the folks, you had to be that way. So I would just think that it would be very similar. And I could be wrong. I have to research that. We'll be doing some research as well. So we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. I gotta get over there. Yeah. Does anybody else have any feedback, questions, things, thoughts that they wanted to make sure to ask while we have Mr. Murphy with us today? No? Okay. I just want to thank you personally for accepting the invitation and taking this time out to, you know, continue these conversations as we, you know, continue our research and being able yeah. to share these. You gave me a lot of little nuggets that mm -hmm. you'll probably be hearing more about as we get <laughs> more research assignments on some different ways to continue to um, do their own research and learn more about some of these hidden pockets of history that we don't get to hear about and so yeah thank you so much yeah <laughs> well let, let, let me let me say this real quick and this is from a mental health aspect only right when you have been part of an oppressed group for such a long period of time and there's never been a sense of reprieve ever there's never been a moment to where you felt equity and equality was afforded to you there are a lot of things from a mental health aspect are going to show up in your life and you will be triggered in ways in which you would have never thought that you would be triggered because it's deeply embedded in your DNA via epigenetics and everything else, right? And so when we talk about the various different diagnoses that people of color have in this, in this country, whether it's bipolar, manic depression, schizophrenia, uh, and so forth and so on, we also have to look at things from a historical perspective and ask in our genealogy, in our family tree, when was there ever a moment to where from a societal standpoint and an interpersonal standpoint, this person had the liberties and true autonomy to be well, meaning did not have to worry about food scarcity, did not have to worry about their physical safety, did not have to worry about their mental or their spiritual safety. If you're not able to identify a time in which you, your ancestors were privileged enough, or even you today, to have those moments and say that I can stand firm on saying that I am living in a truly equitable space. And these measures and these things that I had to think about under the auspice of tyranny is not there. That is a huge reason in which why we're the most diagnosed and underdiagnosed people in this country. People aren't walking around and want to just be walking around waking up drinking at nine o'clock in the morning every single day, right? Like there's so much self-medication that happens within communities of color because of the historical trauma that has been occurring and there hasn't been a break from it, right? So when we talk about 
folks uh, or indigenous folks to where alcoholism is at a very high rate, we have to ask ourselves, well, where is that coming from? How is historical trauma tied to that? Or in, that, in, in, in the, in the uh, communities of African, uh, people of African descent, the same thing. Where was the break? And reconstruction thing looks things look good. We had a lot of people in politics, you know, reconstruction, having businesses, et cetera, et cetera. But then we had folks hating and they were blowing up spot, blowing up places. Right? Like South Carolina and I think Mississippi had more black folks in, in the government than than white. If I recall that correctly. But then come around the 1920s, 1910s, 1898, what happened in Wilmington with the massacre? They burnt down the town, all black businesses, black businesses that white folks were coming to to get loans, dentists, uh, doctors, white folks were going to black folks for this. And they destroyed it. Of course, we know what was happening in Tulsa. We know what happened in Rosewood, all these different places, right? And so just think about it. You get a moment of progression and then glass water comes down. So now you're having to regroup and try to put everything all together again. And then we see how back then we were able to rebuild our churches, rebuild our businesses, et cetera, et cetera. But then now you have these different loan systems and everything that comes out where you got to go to the banks and they're using predatory lending or they're just discriminating on you just because. So now you're not able to catch up as fast as you were back then when you were more resourceful and had your own because now land has been taken and all this and all that. So now your window to recoup and to get back where you were at, guess what? It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we're fighting Right, we're in this wet paper bag trying to find our way out, have the intellect to do it. We know how to do it. We've been there before, but all the powers to be are against us. Banks are discriminating on us if we went to an HBCU and not offering us the same amount of pay, or you're not getting the role that you would like to get because you are a female. And not only a female, but you're a female and you're a person of color. Or you're a trans person and you're a trans person of color. It's a lot. And so just think about how do you uplift yourself on a daily basis? How do you have in, enough intrinsic motivation for yourself to where you can pull yourself out of those negative uh, self-perceived notions of yourself of not potentially being good enough when you're constantly being slapped down? Not every day is going to be a win when you bear melanin because things from a systemic standpoint are 1,000% against you, right? And so just think about that from a mental health standpoint. And when, and, when, and when you think about that, also think about what your responsibility is in making sure that self-care is a priority for you. You all have to start picking up self-care habits right now because when you do get out into the real world, you're gonna recognize how challenging it is and if you don't have the tools to help heal and lick your own wounds whenever you've been hurt, I'm telling you, you will feel like it's you against the world on a daily basis. I don't feel like that every day, but trust me, some days I do. Just the other day, I had to go to this store here in Charlotte that's called South Park. And it's a, it's a, it's a mall, um, and it's a high-end mall, but I had to get a gift. And I put on khakis and everything else. Why? Because when you go in there and you just got on jeans or a hoodie, you're followed around. And it's, I just don't have, I just didn't feel like I had, most days I would just go however I want. But I knew that that day, I just, I just didn't feel like dealing with it. I want to go in there, look however I need to look just so I can get in and get out, right? And that's just one example. But think about how many of them we have on a daily basis. If you want to go to, potentially a high-end restaurant and it's not owned by a person of color but the food's good and you want it but you know that you have to show up in a certain type of way right or if you want to go look at a house in this specific neighborhood you know at one point in time we went looking for a house and the neighbors uh, everybody pretty much came out on their porches it was like they called folks and they're like oh, why is there these black folks over here you know, we had a house previously where we were told that we need to remove everything ethnic in our house before we sold it. 
I chose not to. And we probably lost a couple thousand dollars for that. But I chose to not make myself small in that situation by removing the art. So I, I just wanted to end my part by saying that there are a lot of instances that are um, very similar to the institutional slavery. It's just manipulated itself in a way that is more modern and that still affects you holistically, but it's the onus is on us to be able to put things in place to help continue learning about it and combating it uh, as a group as well as individually and recognizing that you do have choice and you do have opportunity to not allow it to take you under because a lot of people it has, for sure. Yeah. And, and I can be found at History Before Us on all platforms, um, on social media, History Before Us website is historybeforeus.com. And it's just how it sounds. It's spelled just how it sounds, History Before Us. And you can follow some of my work. So, yeah. Thank you. And, you know, what you were just saying was, you know, I'm going to have a quick conversation with them before they log off. Because you can really see that this is the inheritance. This is the yeah. and how the legacy of enslavement in these ongoing ways to where we now have, because it's our norm, mm -hmm. we don't see it as modern day, you know, yeah. forms of enslavement because it's how we're living. And by doing this type of work, it's an opportunity for, when you're talking about, you know, acts of resistance and self-care that mm -hmm. uh, educating themselves and participating in these types of projects and taking advantage of the opportunities that they have, that, you know, that's a way to, change that legacy to one day get that space where you can breathe you know you can um, yes have that freedom and to see how that changes the legacy so that was perfect absolutely um, way to to bring it on home and thank you once <laughs> again like i say you know yep. your willingness and you you know letting us pick your brain for this hour and sharing with you um i really appreciate it no problem. I appreciate I appreciate you all, future leaders, for doing what it is that you're doing and soaking up these experiences because we need champions just like you all. And I know you all are going to go on and do some great things. And if you ever need any, um, you know, have any questions or anything, I'm always available. Um, again, historybeforeus.com, uh, at History Before Us on all social media, and and, and uh, email is historybeforeus at gmail. So, again, literally <laughs> history before us. <laughs> You can find me. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Frederick. You have a great week. All right. Peace All and right. blessings, everybody. Stay on for a second. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you to all those that could hang in for the hour. And um, I think it gave us a lot of um, context for as we're getting ready to move into this next level of research and you know and it's also a good period for those you know who where Ghana was the whole experience so and Princess Anne I saw your camera on girl turn your camera on so we can see you hey sweetie <laughs> we missed you Hold on, you're muted, sweetie. Sorry. I'm sorry, I've missed you guys. <laughs> Are you at home? You're not back at school yet? No, we'll be going later in the year. Okay. See, I told you you'd see us again. Here we are. It's only January 7th. We're doing good. <laughs> How have you been? I've been good. And I have something to say about the colorism. Mm -hmm. So um, I've seen it go on in our schools. So the people who are not fully Ghanaian or like they are Ghanaian, but they are of lighter skin color, they are allowed to keep their hair. They are allowed mm -hmm. to keep their hair because we don't know why, but they are allowed to keep their hair. While those who are darker or fully Ghanaian, have to cut their hair. 
I think that's like one of the modern enslavement is mm-hmm. something going on right now. It is definitely a residual of that. I'm curious, have you ever asked, like, has anybody, like your parents or anybody ever asked or yeah. challenged it? They just kind of go along with it. Nobody challenges it. Yeah. It might be you. Don't get yourself put out of school, though, baby. Get your education. <laughs> but <laughs> something to, you know, to think about. So thank you for sharing that. I'm so happy you were able to get on. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm happy. <laughs> Just bye. Bye, sweetie. Anybody else have any closing thoughts? About to think about, digest, process, and um, move on. And Ecclesia, I wanted to thank you for that first question. That was a really, really good question. And I think um, something that we'll be talking about Tuesday in terms of as we're working on the exhibits for Africa to feature some of the um, acts of resistance by women, I think would be really cool. Yes, luxury. I also just found it really interesting about the drapetomania. Yeah, I want to research that. So, okay, so that's going to be you. I'm already going to tell you that. I want you to research that because I think that those are the things that, you know, we just, you never hear about. And this is an opportunity to, you know, we're going to take advantage of the opportunity to share new information. So, um, and if there's other questions or thoughts, you can relay them to me or, you know, reach out directly to Frederick, like, hey, can you give me, you know, any other instances of X, Y, Z? And, you know, you can see he, He's always been super, super supportive. And as you can see, he, he reads way more than I do. So he knows way more. So please, you know, also use that as a resource. But um, those are two of the things that I wrote down that I want to do some more work on to be able to share because that's, you know, things that people definitely don't get to hear about. All right, guys, you guys have a good week. I will see you Tuesday um, for OGL. We're going to be on Zoom again. Um, we'll be on Zoom through January till the 23rd. 23rd, we'll be in person at EIS. We're going to be doing a run through of our um, 27th um, event. So, but up to then, we'll be on Zoom. All right, guys, have a great weekend. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Princess Anne. Bye. Get some sleep. <laughs>